So as you can see, we have Megan Wu, who is going to join us later, Cindy Jones, Kirsten Renner, and myself. You know about me. Uh, Cindy, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, my name is Cindy Jones. I am currently a principal security consultant with Rapid7, back on the back wall. If you're interested in any kind of prospective hiring opportunities, go there. Um, we, I have been in information security for a while. Um, I've been in IT for a really long time. I have a Microsoft certification number that's six digits and starts with a three. So I've been in IT for a long time. Um, it evolved to a security program, and I've been with Rapid7 for about three and a half years now, and I love what I do. And Kirsten, tell us about you. Is this working? Hello. Yeah. Um, Kirsten Renner. I'm the director of recruiting at Novetta, an advanced analytics and cybersecurity company. Um, and to tell you how long I've been doing this, um, the first and only um, program that I ever wrote was in Visual Basic when Visual Basic was new and exciting. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I can code in, in index cards, but that's how long ago my coding career is. <laughs> it's another. I'm, it's another story for another day. Yeah, I I can do punch cards. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually, um, my. Alter ego is uh, the car hacking village, which is um, I'm. Uh, thank God I have a Hermione uh, time turner because I'm actually there right now, um, sorting out boxes. So. so one of the things we're going to touch on is why volunteer. You know, a lot of us think that volunteering is cool, and you know, you're part of the cool kids club to do it, but. I wanted Kirsten to touch a little bit more on the Car Hacking Village and why you volunteer. And then, Cindy, I love your story about how you got into volunteering. So, Kirsten? Uh, thank God for my relationship with you because uh, while I've been so passionate about the things that I've learned in the, in, primarily in the DEF CON community but in the InfoSec community, um, it never occurred to me until we started having these conversations, um, hey, these are skills. These are... I, I, I have to manage humans, I have to manage a schedule, I have to react to problems when vendors don't show up or things don't work out. So it's, there's a lot of things that you can translate into actual you know, work-related um, skills and, and areas of expertise that are occurring while you're volunteering, right? So um, in particular, just every little detail and all the things that are gonna pop up that you didn't expect or that you tried to pre-plan for and so forth, um, all these things are going to, you know, got to remind people that you uh, are running on volunteer time and, and sponsor dollars and everything's not going to be perfect. Um, but by the way, 20,000 people are showing up, so hope it works out. So, Cindy, tell us about your volunteering. So, I've always been somebody who likes to get involved with things. I like getting in on the ground floor, finding out how things work. Um, when I first started getting involved with, I mean, I've been volunteering since I was probably, I don't know, a Girl Scout. I don't even know. It's been forever. Um, Volun got sucked into a sorority in college and became the head of just about every gosh forsaken um, panel that there was there. And when I got into IT, I would start going to conferences, and I was attending a lot, but my background is in, isn't in IT or, or in uh, security. My background, as far as school went, I was a psych major. So I intrinsically want to help people, right? Psychology is scary as heck. I don't want to know about the human mind anymore. I found that out going through school. But ended up going to, uh, just started getting into IT, getting into security, and when I'd show up at a conference, if I didn't know anybody, it was like, hey, is there anything I could do to help out? What can I do? How can I help out? Because of that, I started developing an amazing, I mean, my contact list is stupid. I've got more Chris's in my contact list than anything. I know. Every, wait, if I say Chris right now, raise your hand. Seriously. If there's a, I mean, I know I see one, two, at least three in the room, okay? So, but you end up getting all these great networking possibilities and options to go ahead and reach out to people to get, you know, insight into what's going on in their field, or if you're interested in checking out their field and what's happening there. But my initial intro into volunteerism was started really young, and it's all because I want to help. But what about your first time when you went to DEF CON? When I went to DEF CON? Yeah. 
my first DEF CON experience helping out. No, didn't you go to DEF CON for a while and not volunteer? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's another thing. Okay, so I spent, when I, I lived overseas for a while, and there was a gap in my, my volunteer world, and I have been going to DEF CON since DEF CON 13, and I was always... Before I started building this wonderful list of Chris's, um, I had basically uh, been going there, and I've been hiding in my room. I'm not a really social person, believe it or not. I mean, I know a lot. I've probably talked to like at least a third of you guys in the room today, or over the past day and a half. I am not a social person. I love being my, you know, being quite happy in my room, watching the stream of the talks, or going to the talks and then going back to my room to recharge or what have you. And I realized I was just taking. I was taking a lot. So that whole wanting to help people thing, aspect of my personality, I was just ignoring it. It wasn't happening. So when I finally was able to go ahead and make that connection, going, wait, I need to start giving back a little bit. That's how I discovered B-Sides. Um, B-Sides was just starting out. Um, it was B-Sides, the second B-Sides Las Vegas that I got involved with at the very beginning. And I'm like, let me help with vet registration. What can I do? That was one of those things, like, how can I help? What can I do? Because I really wanted to be able to give something back. That in and of itself, I actually, it allowed me to learn how to communicate with people. Um, it was the starting point of starting to develop some skills that I didn't think I had. I was always the one in my room. I was always the one being shy. Now I'm like, hey, what's up? What's your name? How you doing? You know, what do you do? Who do you work for? What's going on with you? And just learning how to communicate with people on a level that hopefully isn't too intrusive, <laughs> but at the same time, just be able to get, communicate in a means that was effective. And your confidence level. Oh so. my gosh, out the, up the, out the wazoo. Um, my job now, I'm on a routine basis, have to speak to whether it's you know, board members, whether it's a C-suite, whatever the case may be, and tell them basically that their security program sucks, and this is how it sucks. I am able to go into an organization now and confidently and sit there and explain to them why it is that their baby is ugly. You know, what's wrong? How they can go ahead and fix it. And because that is strictly due to the fact that I've practiced communicating with people at all levels, at all skill levels, in all levels of within organizations in order to be able to express that to them effectively. And the, I did a survey over the last three months oh, yeah. of the community to sort of say, okay, how many of you are volunteering in the community, and what are the skills that you are gaining through that? And what was interesting is that teamwork and ability to collaborate was a skill that 82% people were able to say, yes, this is something that we got. Yeah. Organizational skills, 75% said that was one of the major skills that they learned. Communication, we're so big on communication. Can people write? Can they speak? 76% said that that was the major skill that they learned by volunteering. Planning, 75%. Networking. So it was these key skills that we're needing in the workplace, that we're needing in teams, that people are automatically learning by volunteering in the community. So Kirsten, sort of put the recruiter's lens on this. So when you see someone who volunteers in the community, what are some of the things that you're looking for them to say on their resume? I see a lot of resumes that say, besides, besides, besides. But that doesn't tell me anything. How would someone write their volunteerism on a resume that would pop out for you? So before I was doing this, earlier I was over there looking at resumes, and um, nine out of ten of the resumes that I looked at, I discovered while I was talking to those people that they did things. They did things in the community. They did things that aren't on the resume. And it's important. Um, it's important that you identify um, people who are like, should I talk about my interests? Should I talk about the things that I'm studying? Yeah, you should, you should reveal to us what you're proactively doing uh, to develop yourself. And that includes going to conferences and volunteering and, and maybe for me, because I have been a volunteer for so long, maybe it, it's it's something that I'm looking for. But I absolutely think that people should um, should include that in their in their resume. And what I think is interesting is a lot of people just say I volunteer rather than say I'm in charge of sponsorship. So I'm in charge of going out and securing funds. I'm in charge of overall conference management, and we're going to go into that a little bit more. But being very specific about talking about, are you the subject matter expert that presented? Are you the person that managed all the volunteers? Can you delegate? Can you plan? Can you organize?
recognize. So don't just say, I volunteered, add what that business component is. Now, if it's you just showed up for the day, that's fine, but you showed up, you participated, you were out there in the community. These are all things that you know recruiters are gonna be looking for. So let's dive a little bit more into conference management. Cindy, you started Beside San Antonio. I did. So let's talk a little bit more about what the skills were that you learned being part of Beside San Antonio, and how did you work with your employer on being able to do that? So when I first started Beside San Antonio, I was doing, um, I was working with the government as a contractor. Um, the, depending, I don't know how familiar most of y'all are with the uh, government contracting world, but you get very limited PTO. Um, and there's also very little room for negotiation in those contracts at times. So they get paid for having a body in a seat for X number of hours. That's all there is to it. Um, when you're going above and beyond that, you're, it's not gonna, you don't, and these government agencies and the contractors that they work with don't receive the same benefit from being involved with a small security conference a localized security conference. My bosses were all in DC. They really didn't care about security conference in San Antonio because number one, they weren't really in, their, in the business of security anyways. And number two, they're in DC. They don't, that's got no impact on them. So working with them in that regard was very difficult. Um, I ended up going the hole with PTO. Uh, when I left my last, my last job with the DOD, I ended up, I think I owed them my last paycheck, after my last, last paycheck. It, it was nothing pretty. Um, but for me, it was worth it because I was doing something for the community and that was something that really, really mattered to me. Um, since then, I've been very fortunate to have handed off besides San Antonio. I did that for three years. And that was while I was working at DEF CON and while I was doing my job here and while volunteering for the rest of Besides Texas organizations, DFW and Austin, and we had one in Houston. So there was a lot happening there when I was involved with that. Um, but all that time was on me, right? This is something I chose to do. Now, since then, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, when I left the uh, DOD world and working as an Air Force contractor, I fell into, gratefully, into Rapid7. And as you can see, Rapid7 is pretty present in the community, right? We're, we're, we're everywhere, right? And there, there has never been a case of them not being supported. As a matter of fact, the reason why I was recruited by Rapid7 is because of the community involvement that I had. And that was one of the reasons why they hired me. They like it when people are getting out there and spreading their word, you know, Perhaps you're going ahead and you know branding your slide deck if you're giving a talk, or you know. But they know that I am with Rapid Seven. I carry my business cards. I hand those out, and they're very supportive in that regard. They ensure that I get to conferences because most conferences don't pay for them. So, can you drill down a little bit more in conference management? You did. Did you know what you were doing when you started B Side San Antonio? Oh my gosh, I had no idea. It was such a mess. Um, I was really lucky. I had some mentors, so that was hugely important. Um, but I had no idea what to deal with when it came to, I didn't realize, you just don't think about it, right? You guys, you guys people come to a conference and they're not involved with it. They're just like, wow, that's a really cool show. Oh, look at the cool artwork. Oh, look at, you know, I register here. Or they have sponsors that are doing this. They, people don't have a clue on what goes into conference management. Because San Antonio was tiny. I mean, and you look at something like this and you're just like, it's mind boggling. So, so finance management. Finance management. You're dealing with personnel management because you have to go ahead and get the crew that's going to run the event. You then have to manage that crew. You have to hope that you're finding responsible volunteers, which... Sometimes don't show up. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a hit on Megan. That's not... I don't No, no, her. no. <laughs> but, you know, we, you just, you're stuck in a position where you have, this has to be done to a certain level of expectation that you set for yourself, and it doesn't always work out the way you want, but you learn so much. Dealing with people, gathering money. Oh my goodness, I'm horrible at it. I learned this because I dove in head first, got it done, but oh my gosh, so difficult. So Kirsten, talk to us a little bit more about, you know, if you saw all of the things that Cindy does, now would that turn you off as to her for thinking that she's gonna be out in the community and not doing her job? 
or how can you drill down in interviews and find out the skills that she has been using? I mean, would you find that valuable in her beyond her technical skills? Uh, so from a recruiting perspective, I, I, I have an unfair advantage in, in a, the lens that I'm looking through. Um, I, I realize that just organizing a village is not the same thing as organizing an entire conference, but um, the volume of people that we have coming in and the, the amount of things we have to deal with. Today we realized, this morning we realized, oh crap, we need insurance. Um, and we aren't sure if we have all the dedicated power grids that we need for all the things that we're going to be plugging in and we don't want to blow up the flamingo, oh <laughs> maybe, probably. Um, so uh, for me, uh, I'm, going to look, I'm going to look through a different lens, right? But right. typically, um, if you as the candidate or as the potential candidate um, are able to articulate all the many things that she was describing or that anybody that is, is volunteering, even if you're just strictly the person managing the sponsorship, if you're, oh my God, did anybody think about uplighting? Is that a thing? Do we need that? Do we want it to be dark? And, and why are we just feel, realizing this now a year, you know, a year into it? Um, so for me, uh, I, I encourage people um, to make sure that you are able to articulate those things. Find a volunteer at a place like this, Higher Ground in particular, that can help you articulate those things on your resume. Um, but uh, I, I can't imagine any recruiter worth their salt that isn't going to see value in your volunteer time. The, the fact that you are uh, outside of the things that you have to do. This is what I say to students. This is what I say to engineers at every level. Tell me about the things that you're doing that help you develop professionally that you didn't have to do, that you're not getting paid to do, that your coursework didn't require you to do. Right? I, I, no recruiter worth it isn't going to see great value in that. So one thing that I always recommend, and I rarely see anyone doing this, is any volunteering that you do, take a few moments after your shift, after the time that you're there, and write down what you did. So this, this pertains to volunteering for the day. This pertains to a competition. It's keeping that sort of journal of, did I de you know, deconflict a situation? Did I verbalize something in a way that someone else understood it? Did, was there a technical problem that no one knew how to solve that I was able to solve? It's really being able to create those real life experiences that you can share in an interview. Because how many of us have gone into an interview and they say, Explain to me a time when you learned something new. Oh, can I, uh, can I talk to that right now? Go right ahead. Oh, my gosh. So, okay, so I don't know how many of you were impacted by the kerfuffle with the badges yesterday. Okay, it was a mess. I, thank you for your patience. We appreciate you. Um, I basically had to stand in front of a line of people and say, there will be no walk-in badges. Go home. And that was devastating for me. This is like, this is, I've been here forever. This is my con. People come in. Yes, this is awesome. And they had to kick people out. And they don't care what I'm feeling. They're like, well, dang, I've been sitting here since six this morning. What the heck's going on? So to be able to say that I de-escalated that to a certain degree and assisted with that in that manner, that's, that's a major skill that I wouldn't have had if it wasn't for the, the participation that I have here. Um, I basically had to tell about 300 people, get out. And then I got to welcome them back with open arms afterwards, which was wonderful. But that's besides the point. And, and you're going to go home and write about that. Oh, or, my gosh. I, I, you know, any yes. time Conflict resolution. You, so good. Yeah. So I, I think you have to understand that these are real life experiences that you're going to be able to use in talking in an interview, in a face-to-face -face interview, being able to talk about it when you're on a phone screen. I know we're running out of time, but I'm still going to move a little bit farther. So... Competitions. It's interesting that many recruiters are now starting to look at which competitions are you part of and really looking at are you learning the skills that you need in the competition. So I would highly recommend that if you're in a competition, even if you didn't win it, Definitely list it on your social media profile. Definitely list it on your resume. And also be sure, again, to look at it after the end of the competition rather than, you know, high-fiving we won, having that beer. Definitely say, okay, what was the technical skill that I learned? What did I mess up on? You know, what did I fail? We learn more when we fail than when we succeed. 
who, how did I communicate with other people? Because you're actually in an environment where there's a time crunch, there's a resource crunch, it's a problem you've never seen before, and you're working with people that you've never worked with before. Gee, what does that sound like? That sounds like work. Real life. Okay, yeah. that's real life. <laughs> so why are you not journaling those situations so that, yes, you may not have all of the work experience that the job is asking for that you can say on your resume, but if you've done 10 to 12 competitions, I'm sorry, but that translates into work experience because you've been in that work environment. Absolutely. If you're looking to get into another industry, if you're looking to get into another skill set, Broaden your horizons. Go to the Car Hacking Village. Go to Cyber 912, which is a cyber policy CTF. Go to any other CTF so you can expand your knowledge. If you're looking to move into another industry, really consider going to the CTFs there because not only are you going to learn the skills, you're also going to network. And we all know the number one way to find a job is networking. The other thing, and I'm going to ask Kirsten to talk about this as well, is presentations. So you may not be the person that wants to, you know, de-escalate 300 people having to walk out the door. You may not be the person that wants to be in competitions, but you do like to present. Now, Kirsten, what would you look at if someone presented a lot? What, what does that say to you? Do you say, oh, I don't want to talk to them, or do you say... I do want to talk to them. Um, it, 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 it just so happens that when we did our call for papers, you know, we had to look at a lot of presentations and then all those presentations had to be scrubbed. Um, so that I guess I need to remember to put that on my resume that yep. I can scrub presentations. Um, you know, it takes bravery too, right? Um, it, the people that are smiling, maybe me, maybe you, uh, maybe we're tired, maybe we're nervous, um, imposter syndrome, it's, it's a thing, Google it, like it, sometimes you feel terrified, like why do I even deserve to be here, why am I an expert, right, it's all normal I stuff, right, so the majority of the people perform, you know, that are, that are getting up, that are doing their presentations, um, they may, they may some, say something you don't agree with. You can collaborate with them. Um, they're taking the time. They're, they're not, probably not getting paid to do it, um, but they're putting together their presentation, and there's a lot of planning that goes into that. Um, uh, the, the one time you made me put an actual, uh, <laughs> for Recruit DC, actually put some slides together, I can't tell you how much I stressed over every little graphic is, are people going to laugh at that? Is that funny? Is that cute? Is that relevant? Right? Um, a lot goes into it, right? So absolutely. And I also will encourage you, um, if, if maybe it doesn't make sense for you to be in a competition, um, you, can still, you can still go to them. And you go to the talks, too, right? There's so much to learn. Um, and besides the competitions and the, and the CTFs and the cool prizes and all that stuff, um, it, it definitely shows that you worked on a team and some of the best lessons, my unsolicited favorite question for if you're recruiting that you should ask and if you're the candidate that you should uh, volunteer before you get asked, and I know I told this to a couple people today, talk about your failures. Right, you don't put it on your resume. You don't say hey, I messed up the thing, but so when you talk about your accomplishments, you're going to reveal so much about yourself when you describe, give your testimony to the thing that broke, to the thing that blew up, to the thing that didn't work. Uh, do you blame others? Do you do you figure it out? Do you learn from it? Are you prepared in the future to not blow up the robot? Um, so I would recommend all, to think about catch your your interviewer off guard and and talk about what you did and how it didn't work and what you learned from it because everybody makes mistakes. So the one thing I would say about presentations, realize that it takes a lot more time management than you would think. So understanding that, you know, the RSA, if you're going to submit for an RSA, they close tomorrow. Yeah. And, and, and that just went out this morning. I don't know how many of us missed, you know, that the deadline's for tomorrow. Yeah, that sucks right in the middle of... Yeah. But understanding that one of the reasons why people think that presenting is a hand-picked club. 
and it's not. It is be someone who puts through a defined outline of what they're going to speak about. They know when to submit it. They know how to fill it out correctly. I can tell you there is not a uniform way of filling out a proposal submission. One of the most difficult that I've had to do, even more difficult than RSA, has been Grace Hopper. And it, it, it was it's an eight-section uh proposal. And it's great because then it's now my foundation for every single other, you know, conference that I submit to, which is, you know, I did all that work in in a week. So, (laughs) but realize if you're going to present, if you have to engage your employer or not, I know that one of our resume uh, career coaches over there, we had to engage her employer nine months ago to make sure that she could present here. And then you can also decide, do you want your employer to know that you're presenting or are you doing it on your own? And that's your own um, decision. So we're going to move into some final thoughts here because uh, a theme today, a sort of underlining theme, has been burnout. And one thing that happens when I did the survey, 80% of the people who said that they do volunteering, they said it stresses them out. <coughs> And what was interesting is that they said that they would kill, still do it, but 80% of the community says that burnout, stress, is a major part of them volunteering. It's back stress, it's headaches, it's migraines, it's anxiety, it's depression, <laughs> and they still do it. So one of the things that I want Cindy to sort of touch on is how you look at delegating your succession and how you look at how you move on. Because the one thing that I will say is if you tend to burn a bridge in a volunteer situation, you are probably doing the exact same thing in your career. You're probably taking, you're probably going much farther than you should and then you're doing the high middle finger and walking out and trying to find a next job the other day rather than planning your exit. So, Cindy, how did you plan your exit with B-Side San Antonio or any other situation? So, with B-Side San Antonio, my first year there, as I mentioned, I had a spectacular mentor. Uh, Michael Goff was with uh, B-Side's Austin at the time, and he was just feeding me information. Hey, you need to time this. You need to time that. You need to time that. So, he basically trained me, which was wonderful. Um, I, with his help, and what I thought was the help of a committee, which ended up not being a committee, even the guy who was only supposed to get the beer moved out of town and didn't even find the beer for me, um, didn't even source it, it was horrible. Um, <laughs> so the, I ended up doing that with my, myself with his assistant. So the next year, I had it planned out, I knew how to go about doing it, and I tried bringing in a couple of key people who seemed as passionate as I was about it. Um, by the beginning of the planning cycle for the third year, I knew I needed to step back. Three years doing an entire conference on your own is exhausting. The stress levels were ridiculous. The amount of time it was taking me to take off of work, I didn't share that with anyone. And I was fortunate enough to have somebody involved, kind of on the periphery, but a lot of that was my fault because I wasn't very good at delegation yet, that was willing to take it on. And I basically kind of said, hey, by the way, this is my last year. Here you go, about a year out. So he had a year to get used to the idea and a year to object to it. Um, So I was very fortunate in that regard. Mm -hmm. Other scenarios are much more touchy, I think. I think, you know, you're basically the Wikipedia for your subject, right? So for instance, here I lead registration for B-Sides LV. I've I've ran registration or been a part of registration since B-Sides LV 2. That's been a while. I've got the historical knowledge. Me and three other people are the oldest tenured staff members here. I've got the historical knowledge. How do I hand that off? If I were to say, next year's my last year, who do I hand that off to? Do you groom staff members? And are they willing to stay on after you leave? You know, I mean, you end up building a pretty tight team. It's just like any other organization. But because it's volunteer work, it's, I don't want to say it's easier to step back from, but there's more, I think it's a higher likelihood that a team of people would remove themselves than in a paid position. So it's, it's looking at succession planning and leadership planning, and it brings back to the point that someone is not responsible for your career. 
you are responsible for your career and you are responsible for having that conversation with your manager as to where you go in your company. And if you're in a volunteer position, you need to have the risk, you need to be responsible enough to say, I'm starting to get burned out. I'm starting to get tired. Indeed. A lot of us who get involved in the community say, no one can survive without me. I'm going down with the ship. And that is where burnout <laughs> happens. You have to say, I'm at this point where I'm tired. I'm still having fun and I need to plan it about two years out and let the people know. Don't hold it as a secret and say, oh, by the way, tomorrow's my last day. I think, you know, we would all get shot if we did that or something like that. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. We would all have people get very upset. So, Kirsten, I know you've been involved in a variety of things. How do you handle sort of succession planning or handing things off or delegating or do you not do that? <laughs> I could, that's an area where I can definitely improve. Um, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, delegating is also an area where I, uh, I don't want to say I struggle or that I don't get it right. It's part of management every day. Um, but uh, asking for help is something that you need to, you're like, wait, I'm the helper. Uh, learning how to ask for help, right? Is, yeah. <laughs> is, 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 is sometimes a, a struggle. Um, I have a New Year's resolution uh, for three years running um, that I will do less and not overextend myself. And I'm not going to call out any conference in particular, but there's one, there's a lot of conferences happening the week of summer camp. And uh, one of them I'm not attending. You can see me here and you'll see me somewhere else in a couple of days, but I just, I'm not stepping foot over there. I'm just done. <laughs> um, it just, for me, it's exhausting. Um, it's, it's, it's too much. Um, so you have to, you have to, that's a, it's humility too, right? To, to realize when you've reached your limitations and then to, uh, it's your own time management also, right? Besides the resources and the vendors and all the things that you need, you need to manage yourself. Um, so you, you have to give in a little bit, surrender. <laughs> so this is the last presentation for Higher Ground and before I start crying, because you know, this is always a, a labor of love. Um, do we have any questions about volunteering or do we want to just have a offline, not videotaped conversation about this afterwards? What's the vote? No questions? Okay. Thank you so much for listening to our conversation. It has actually been videotaped as well. We're going to be doing this presentation again at DerbyCon. Yeah. We actually have all of the community <laughs> survey data about community volunteering and career development that we're going to be releasing there. Thank you so much, and thank you for being part of Higher Ground. Thank you. Thank you.